So our topic now is to look at the evolution of religion, because just as the animal and plant world evolved, uh, so does the world of religions. We can look at this in two ways. Uh, one of these would be how religions evolve individually. Most, if not all of them, start with a founder, evolve into sects with different views that stand alone and apart from society, and then finally some of them evolve into national religions like Buddhism in Thailand or Anglicanism in England. But there's another level at which we can look at how religions evolve universally. And when we say religions, really we mean primary worldviews that dictate thoughts and actions. So it is not just the Abrahamic model when we use the word religion here, and I'll exchange that word with the word worldview quite often. Everyone has a worldview. So the other way that religions evolve, just to put it in brief, they evolve from the tribal era, the era of the shaman and magic, through the level of the so-called great religions, Confucianism or the scholarly tradition as it's better known as, uh, Taoism, Buddhism, and then Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, Christianity. Um, all of these emerge from movements during the Axial Age period in the middle of the first millennium of the Common Era, when figures like the Buddha, Socrates, and Confucius emerge in three mega regions of our planet uh, to change the way of human thinking from the old gods of the city-states and the personal empowered gods of the Greek pantheon or the Hindu uh, Vedic deities and in an era of increasingly pan-ethnic empires, we see critical thinking emerge. And we're going to look today at E.B. Tyler's uh, views of this, how religion evolves from magic through religion, as he defines that, up to the modern period of science. And of course, most of your great 19th century intellectuals thought science was going to replace religion, a controversial notion. So as we can see here in our first slide, what does he mean uh, by this exactly, uh, saying that somehow religion is the antithesis of science on the one hand and magic on the other? His claim is that Religion, and remember, he's a 19th century European intellectual, so that's his idea of this, and he's not aware of the Eastern ones that tend to be more impersonal, but that religion is about a personal being to whom one can pray and petition for good health or even money. And this period of religion emerges out of a prior period of tribal religions where the shaman worked what looked like magic. According to Tyler, the shaman was practicing a kind of science to try to coerce rain from a cloud by doing a special dance or the like. And science, like magic in that sense, operates according to impersonal laws. So we have the three, magic, religion, and then science. And that is the evolution of religions universally, but let's take a closer look, shall we? Tyler's thinking was that whenever two religions diverge, one must be more advanced. He was influenced like so many others by Charles Darwin's uh, origin of species and the notions of evolution that were such hot topics in the 19th century. Upon becoming aware of Darwin's work, then it was clear to Tyler that religions must also evolve in a similar manner. And sure enough, the evolutionary tree of religions looks remarkably like the tree of life we see outlining the evolution of life through fish and animals up to human beings and the like. So when two religions diverge, 
one must be the evolutionary more fit one. He thought all humans shared a, a unitary consciousness with all others and thus opposed the racism so rampant also among the European intellectuals of the late 19th century. But religions, worldviews, they don't advance at the same pace and this gives rise to his notion of survivals or remnants uh, of traditions that survive from the past, just as we can see remnants of tribal religions today still practicing what he thought of as magic. So how did it all begin, this religion? His thinking was that perhaps, well, the ancients certainly could see their living friend, then when that friend dies, something has exited the body. What is it that exits the body but some kind of spirit? If you impart some kind of spirit to human beings, then it's just a skip and a jump to posit a similar spirit for a tree, let's say, for example. And one single tree spirit then can evolve into uh, a forest goddess. From a forest goddess, then it's another evolutionary leap to conceive of a god of the universe. And to believe that spirits can be found in inanimate objects. The whole world for those ancients was filled with life and ghosts exist and spirits of the ancestors are still with you. So this earliest period, Tyler refers to as the Savage Age. Of course, in the late 19th century, uh, there were superstitions about the ancients that now we know are not so true, that they were not savages. Uh, they were remarkably like us, in fact. And so, of course, it's good to keep in mind as we discuss Tyler or any of our great philosophical thinkers of the late 19th century uh, that they were certainly products of their age. But at any rate, this was the Savage Age, and after this evolved the Barbaric Age, which Tyler refers to with the Greek example. Uh, of course, here we have the ancient city-states, and then deities and spirits begin to mirror the cities. They are patterned on the structure of cities with Zeus as the mayor, Ares as the Department of Defense, Athena and Apollo running education, Hephaestus runs industry, and you get the idea. So the Savage Age, the Barbaric Age, and then the Age of Religion. So here you can see this rather fascinating slide illustrates his point. These periods in orange that you can see here are what he would call the barbaric stage of the evolution of worldviews or religions. And then you can see demarcated here the axial age, that age of pan-ethnic empires, where around the planet mysteriously we see these figures emerge to challenge the old barbaric religions. And then in green here, um, we see the world of religion as Tyler styles it. Religion then uh, dominates the scene until the age of science. And then on this chart, you can see indicated those worldviews that are products of that religious age. And that leads us into the thought of uh, James George Frazier, the author of the famous Golden Bough, and also a student of Tyler's. Frazier thought that uh, magic was more scientific than Tyler did. Tyler calls it the Savage Age, but for Frazier, magic is simply about trying to coerce spirits to do your will to help you find the woolly mammoth pack so that you can eat for the winter, or again, rain dances to cause the rain. In that sense, magic is a kind of proto-science for Frazier. So then, for Frazier, there were two types of what he called sympathetic magic. Magic that's connected um, 
by the practitioner with the object, its target. The first is imitative magic. So, for example, if I want to kill the tribal leader of the tribe next door, I might symbolically enact that person's death uh, in a theatrical type performance. Then in imitation of my act, maybe the tribal leader will die. And then contagious magic is the idea that if I have one of your hairs, I can create an amulet and curse it. It still has some magical connection with you. And of course, the idea of a voodoo doll is a kind of imitative magic. If I make a likeness of someone I don't like and poke it with pins to cause them pain, uh, then we see magic at work. And out of the world of magic comes the world of religion. And here we can see some images from world famous religions. Buddhism and Islam, Christianity, uh, what makes them religions? They are, first of all, pan-ethnic. These are the traditions that survived over many other tribal religions, some founded by cults like Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity, individuals growing into sects, evolving into national churches. And when we look at the Eastern ones, uh, we can see that there are no longer the local deities as supreme um, in the consciousness of human beings, but rather uh, impersonal forces such as the notion of dharma in Buddhism. It's not a god, it's not personal, but it is an all-encompassing reality that's no longer tied to a city-state. And thus Buddhism had the means to spread. Religions do spread a bit like viruses. So those religions that were more fit to the new environment survived, and thus Buddhism could travel through the Greek world of Afghanistan uh, all the way through the Tarim Basin to China, and from China on to Japan, Korea, and from the south, from Sri Lanka and uh, Tamil Nadu, Buddhism spread to Thailand, Cambodia, Burma, um, you name it. And similarly for Islam, it's a universal religion with a monotheos. There's only one God. That God is God of everything, and every human is equal before that God. Likewise, Christianity shares those same universalizing principles. So here are three of the more successful ones, and we can see that uh, the end of the road, of course, is science. So out of all of these regionally dominant religious empires, if you will, science uh, is the one that is truly global. If I can prove something is not true, it is falsifiable, such as the fact that the earth is round. But belief in God is not falsifiable any more than belief in unicorns or leprechauns. I can't prove that they do exist, but no one can prove that they don't exist. But we can prove that the old magic method of bringing rain from a cloud does not exist. We can falsify magic. Science is magic that works, and it's global. And thus we can see the 19th century thinkers, not just Frazier and Tyler, uh, but Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, uh, all of these famous names, uh, saw this coming. And of course, agnosticism is the really scientific view because of falsifiability. If we can't falsify God or leprechauns or unicorns, uh, then it's, I think, more scientific to say I don't know than to say they don't exist. Atheism is an assertion of a belief, a certainty that there is no God. And then finally, we're going to see that science itself is shaped by the religious cultures in which it evolves. So, of course, accepting science doesn't mean anyone has to give up their old religions. 
But I think it's fair enough to say that we're all emerging, evolving into a truly global perspective uh, where it looks like there is consensus among adherents of all religions, all worldviews, that science is here to stay and we can say science caused all these environmental problems with the industrial age and the like, but also we kind of need to look to science now as a savior for the planet. Whether you're in Islamic Afghanistan, you need science. Or whether you're a televangelist in America, you need science to broadcast that. Likewise, monks in Thailand use cell phones. So science cuts across all those traditional mega regional boundaries. And we could really kind of say that science is magic that works.